Thanks so much for joining us today. The Bible reading for this message is taken from Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, through to chapter 8, verse 1. It would be really helpful if you could push pause on this video right now, go and have a read from Revelation 7, 1 to 8, 1, and then come back. We'll see you here in just a moment. Revelation is not a series of events described in sequential visions. Instead, Revelation is a series of visions describing one event. It's kind of like watching the highlights of a sporting event. When something important happens, that highlight of that moment, whether it's a goal that's scored or a wicket that is taken, is played over and over and over each time from a different angle so that you are immersed in that moment and can see and understand exactly what took place, exactly what happened in that moment that changed the course of the game. It's the same goal, or it's the same wicket, but each angle shows it from a different perspective. And that is kind of what's happening here in Revelation. It's a series of visions, but it's really just describing one event from a number of different angles so that we are fully immersed in it and so that John and the church subsequent to John would be able to understand what it was that was taking place in history. Now chapter 7 is a pause after chapter 6 and before we get to chapter 8 and the seventh seal. We've been working through these seven seals. We get to through six seals by the end of chapter 6. There's a pause in chapter 7 and then the seventh seal is opened in chapter 8. And what chapter 7 does is it stretches our imagination to show us just how good salvation really is. The end product of looking at all of this this morning ought to be hope. That's where I want you to be when this is all over, more hopeful than you were before, and perhaps more hopeful than you have ever been. This uh, key text in Revelation 7 is in verse 10 where they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Uh, the cry uh, is not gentle, it's rough, it's loud, it's like a battle cry, salvation belongs to our God. Uh, salvation is part of the most basic vocabulary of the Christian faith. It's like one of the first words that you teach uh, a child, a baby, is mama and dada. Uh, salvation is one of the first words that we learn about uh, when we become Christians. Uh, we learn what the word salvation means and all that it entails. You can't have Christianity without the idea of salvation. Uh, it is an essential word that is part of uh, the irreducible core of what it means to be a Christian. And what they sing about here is not just that salvation belongs to our God, it's literally that salvation is out of God. Salvation is something within God that comes to those who are standing in his presence. And that's why this cry is so rough and loud and joyful and amazing. In fact, in verse 7, the angels join in the worship despite the fact that no angel has ever experienced salvation. They fall down and they worship because they have watched God as he has unfolded salvation in history. With a deep fascination, these angels look on. They have served as messengers and as ministers, and they have such joy in our salvation that they fall down and praise God for seven things in verse 12. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now the vision breaks down into two parts. In the first part of this vision, John sees four angels at four corners holding back four winds. Four is the number uh, of the earth. And so there's no doubt where we are now. We are back on earth. And we're back in time. We're back before the first four seals and the four, first, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse were sent out by the Lamb on their mission. Uh, this is before the disasters of chapter 6 have taken place. So this is like a flashback. And the question is, what happens to God's people when there is 
devastation and disaster and famine and conquest and death and trouble. Uh, we are not immune from suffering as God's people. Christians die of famine and disease and earthquakes and war. Uh, are we just swept up, becoming victims of history along with everybody else? What difference does salvation make and what difference uh, does it make to trust God in these difficulties of life now during this tribulation? And so that John sees these four angels at the four corners holding back the, the four winds. And then I saw another angel, verse 2, coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land and the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. Now, now the seal, think um, a, a period drama, uh, think wax and putting a seal on something, the king's seal or a sovereign seal, uh, that, that's what we have here. It's a wax or a clay stamp that you would put onto a scroll so that its contents cannot be tampered with and are thus safe and true to the author's original intent and message. Uh, the seal of the living God is placed permanently on the foreheads of his servants. That is the picture. And a seal does two things, and it does two things for God's people as well. A seal protects the integrity of what is written in the scroll. It secures what is inside the scroll against meddling and change and interference. You cannot break a seal, go in, scratch out a few lines, change a few things here or there, and for it to be unknown. Think, don't think digital emails that can be hacked. This is analog. If a seal was tampered with, you'll know all about it. Uh, verse 2 then tells us uh, that this angel comes uh, to seal God's people with the seal of the living God. That is, he seals them so that there is no power in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can undo what God has done inside of the lives of those who have been sealed. If you have been sealed, uh, God's seal on your life is stronger than you are. Once we trust in Jesus Christ, God begins to change us inwardly. He gives us a new heart and the seal and seals us with his Holy Spirit so that we belong to him and our lives are now hid uh, with Christ in God. Uh, there is no spiritual power that can steal that away. There's nothing that can break God's seal on you. No one can uh, fiddle around with the life that God has placed inside of you. No suffering, no persecution, no anguish, no torment can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus because God has placed his seal upon us. And notice that it happens uh, before, it happens before, not during, but before everything has taken place that chapter 6 describes. The seal of God protects us. It protects us during difficulties. The seal guards the integrity of what God is growing inside us. Uh, the seal is the language of God uh, preserving us, God preserving us for himself. Uh, so here what we have is the preservation of the saints of God because God has placed his seal upon them. The second thing that a seal does is it is a sign of outward ownership to those who look at it. It's the personal imprint of the author. If you have the seal of the living God on you, then you are not your own. Your life is not about finding your dream and believing in yourself. If you are sealed with this seal, then you do not define who you are. Rather, you belong to the Lamb. Uh, that is your new identity in Jesus Christ. It's not your seal, it's God's seal. It belongs to Him. And that means that you belong to him, a people, a person who is saved for God. So what you have here is uh, that God, in placing this seal upon his people, is placing his seal upon you, is that you now become his consecrated possession. You are his treasured possession. So do you see what's happening here? 
Uh, God is telling his people, he's telling you, uh, that he loves you so much, that he is preserving you for himself, and that you are his consecrated, treasured possession, that you belong to him. Uh, that is the, the point of the 144,000. Then I heard a number, okay? It's important. Listen, he heard a number. In a moment, he's going to see something. But for now, he just hears this. I heard a number. You see, God knows his own. Uh, God looks at us and he knows the genuineness of the true believer. And that's the point of this number, 144,000. It's a neat, symmetrical, mathematical number. It's an exact way of uh, speaking of God's whole people, God's entire people. God knows the exact number of those who are His. He knows us intimately, and He has sealed every single believer for Himself. And it's a stylized number. It's not the usual list of tribes. Uh, that you get from the Old Testament. If you want to know more about that, pop me a message and we can talk about it. But rather, it's a stylized number that is the complete uh, account of the servants of God, lined up as an army of witnesses, eager to give their lives for the one who sits on the throne and for the Lamb. And the point of these first seven verses is that God seals those who are His precisely because there is difficulty coming. He preserves us by making us his consecrated possession because he knows what we will have to endure. And he wants to ensure that we will be able to endure it. God has so designed it that when we experience evil or trials or suffering, we are not left with our own resources, but we are sealed by God. And this is something that's really difficult for us because we live life based on our own resources our own inner strength. The Christian life is the gradual process of learning how to live out of the resources of God, learning to lean into the Spirit who has sealed us. Our endurance does not come by our sheer determination or by our gritted teeth. Real endurance for the Christian, real perseverance for the Christian, comes from transferring our trust from our own inner strength and our own resources to his strength and to his resources. This is true, even though the truth is difficult for us to grasp hold of, but as we begin to grasp hold of it, as we dwell on these things that God is preserving us and that we are his consecrated possession, it becomes terrific. You see, what difference does it make to trust in God in the difficulties of life now? Well, the difference to life now is that God is preserving those who belong to him. Which means whatever difficulty you find yourself in, whatever difficulty it is that you are facing, God is at work in you to preserve you through that difficulty and through that time. And you need to know that you belong to him, that you are his treasure, that you are his reward, that you are what he is working towards in this life. The second half of the vision centers around the throne, so from the earth back to the throne, and it answers the question, what does salvation look like in eternity? It takes place after, so we had a flashback, and now we have a flash forward. If you were a fan of the TV series Lost, uh, there's no flash sideways, so don't worry about that. But this takes place after the return of Christ, and it shows us how salvation works through the cross of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, John doesn't hear, but he looks, verse 9, after this, I looked. So he heard the number 144,000, but then he looked. And when he looked, uh, he saw something that he didn't expect. He thought he'd see 144,000, but he looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white, white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out, Salvation belongs to our God. In the 144,000, we discover that God knows the exact number of those who belong to Him. 
In verse 9, we discover that uh, none are missing from that number. That, that that number is beyond any human number. It, it goes right back to the promise that God gave to Abraham that his descendants would be too numerous to count. Beyond the sand of the seashores, beyond the stars in the sky. They're from every nation, ethnicity, culture, and language in the world. And in verse 13, God wants you to understand what salvation means in eternity as we look at the centrality of the death of Jesus Christ. And he does it by stepping forward and pointing to the multitude and saying, who are these? Uh, now, John uh, is learning quickly, and he answers the elder. He says, who are these? Where did they come from? He says, sir, you know. And the elder responds, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They are washed, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now the answer that John is given is one of the most remarkable pictures of the eternal enjoyment of salvation anywhere in Scripture. And the elder points out two things about the cross. Now remember, we're still answering the question from the end of chapter 6. Who can stand? The first thing that the elder helps us to understand is that the cross is for everyone. Who can stand before the throne and the Lamb, not just on that day, but for all eternity? Can any of us have hope to stand before the Lamb? And we discover in verse 14 that yes, uh, there is hope. Uh, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The tribulation is all the suffering in history. Uh, these are the ones who have sealed and they have come through it. Some have died because of persecution. In fact, they've all died at some point. Uh, but how is it that a person is sealed? That's what we're dealing with here. A person is sealed by having their robes washed and being made white. And it's a very paradoxical picture that you've got going on here. Uh, it's graphic and it's an explicit way of speaking about how the death of Jesus must be made personal for each one of us. What the elder describes is washing in blood. That the way that their soiled garments become white and clean is actually by soaking them in the blood of the lamb that was slain. It's actually grotesque and it's meant to capture our imagination. Uh, because if you wash something in blood, it becomes putrid and rancid and foul. Uh, Jesus dying looks pointless and the waste of a good life. Foolishness to the world. How can anyone conquer by being conquered? How can anyone have victory by becoming the victim? From God's point of view, in the cross of Jesus Christ, God completely overturns the wisdom of the world. It is His blood, His death alone, that can cleanse us. His death makes us alive. 1 Peter 2.24 By His wounds you have been healed. In the cross of Jesus Christ, we see the wisdom of God and the power of God. The danger is that we can become desensitized to this kind of language. We can become desensitized to the idea of salvation and rescue. You have to sit and realize just how jarring this is. How much it says about us and how much it says about God. You see, we're so easily convinced of our own inward cleanness and goodness and self-righteousness. We're always the innocent ones, uh, always the victim. Everything is so unfair. We are so entitled. It takes the Holy Spirit to show us that it is in Christ's death alone that we can be purified and cleansed and strengthened. It's jarring when we hear that our best deeds are like filthy rags. Or when I tell you that Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that the, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I would say, when I say, that's your heart, and you think, no, that's not my heart. And it takes the Holy Spirit to finally open our eyes and open our hearts to realize that that is the truth, that God's Word speaks into our life. And what the elder is saying here is that that change comes and only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. It comes through Him and His death that our robes are washed and made white. Uh, we stand 
before Jesus Christ on that day, not in our righteousness, but in his righteousness, not in our white robes, but in his white robe. And this robe is total and complete. It covers us. It becomes our new identity in Jesus Christ. This is how we are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. And see this, it doesn't just happen automatically. Jesus doesn't come and wash, take your robe and wash it. Uh, we have to actively wash our robes and make them white through his blood. Look at verse 14 again. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Every single individual who is standing before the throne for all eternity has taken this one action, has brought their robe to Jesus. Uh, irrespective of all things, language, race, culture, economic bracket, job title, good deeds, bad deeds, uh, what you think qualifies you or what might you think disqualifies you, every person has simply come to Christ and asked him, please wash me in your blood. That's why we meet week by week by week, so that we do not ever forget this and so that we do not become complacent. Uh, the cross of Jesus Christ is for everyone. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are or how good you think you are, how successful or unsuccessful, the cross is for you. And secondly, uh, the cross is forever. So it's for everyone and it's forever. Look at verses 15 to 17 as we get this incredible picture of what salvation looks like in eternity. Here we're dealing with a reality that no human has ever seen. We're dealing with the future from God that he's revealed to us. Uh, this uh, is what uh, trusting in the cross entails. The close and tender personal presence of God with those who are with him. They are before the throne of God. That, that descri they're, that's describing physical intimate closeness. And they are with him, serving him day and night in his temple, verse 15. The one who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They serve him day and night in his temple, in his sanctuary, in the place where he dwells. He provides for them shelter in his presence. Not out there, not there's a place over there for you. You can have a little hut outside the farmhouse. No, in his presence. And they shall come in, we're told, and they shall hunger no more, and they shall thirst no more. And the sun will not strike them, and the scourging heat will not destroy them. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we will experience the fullest, most intimate, and sweetest fellowship with God in the presence of God forever. We have to remember how remarkable this is. Sin separates us from God. It pollutes us, but it's, it, the, the bigger deal about sin is that it separates from us, us from him. We don't have access to him. Uh, now that separation is reversed. Uh, now we do have access into light and life and joy. And we're given the unspeakable privilege of serving the one who served us. Uh, we're caught up forever doing what is ultimately meaningful. To see and to know the one who made us for himself, with those whom he loves, in the presence of God and the Lamb, who loved us and who gave himself for us. And it's so remarkable that you actually need negatives to describe it. Verse 16, never will they hunger, never will they thirst. Desires will be fulfilled, uh, because underneath all of your desires is actually a desire for God. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, In the presence of God is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And there's even more, as if this wasn't enough. Uh, God wants us to enjoy this. He wants us to see it and hope in it. And in the last verse, the Lamb of God and the Father, there's no reticence in putting them together on the same level. The Lamb in the midst of the throne, literally he's inside the throne, he will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs and fountains of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from every eye. Jesus, the Lamb who was slain for us, 
becomes the shepherd of the Old Testament, and he directs our feet towards the fountains of living water. This is the water that gives eternal life. This is the inner experience of God. He died to save you, and in eternity, he will hold nothing good back from you. The picture is that our desires actually grow stronger and wider and deeper through access to this living water in Jesus Christ so that we're able to take in more as we grow in our capacity to love. You see, in eternity, we will grow. Uh, and the saved, they will always thirst for God the more and the more. So, how do we kind of bring all of this together? Well, friends, the master theme of the Christian gospel is salvation. Salvation is a word picture of wide application, expressing the idea of rescue from jeopardy and misery into a state of safety. Saved from evil, from death, from disaster, from fear, from self, from sin. Saved for good and for glory and for God. Uh, here we have these two pictures of salvation. We get to look at them. Uh, the picture of those who are saved of the church now in history and the church after history. Uh, the, the end product, at the end of looking at all of this, was meant to be hope, increased hope. Because now you know that if you are trusting in God, you are his consecrated possession, and he is preserving you through this time of tribulation. And one day, you will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter you with his presence. Never again will you hunger. Never again will you thirst. The sun will not beat down on you, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be your shepherd. He will lead you to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes.